Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this webinar. Uh, my name is Russell Hancock. I'm the president and CEO of Joint Venture Silicon Valley. And I'm going to take just a moment to tell you about the organization in case you don't already know. Our mission is uh, to pursue the health and vitality of Silicon Valley as a region. We tackle those regional problems that are vexing to us. Uh, the way we do that is by convening Silicon Valley's leaders, uh, by engaging them in dialogue and discussion about uh, our challenges and our opportunities. We provide a steady stream of analysis and reporting uh, and data gathering through uh, our research arm. It's called the Silicon Valley Institute for Regional Studies. And then finally, we tackle problems and we do that by uh, forming teams, working groups, blue ribbon panels, um, a task force, or by creating strategic alliances. So that's, uh, that's who Joint Venture is. That's my role in the organization. I'm joined by a team of people at our organization that uh, have brought you this webinar and uh, oversee and execute all of the work that, uh, that we do. Now, uh, you should understand that one of uh, the Bay Area's uh, continuing challenges is our transportation issues and our um, and, and the provision of public transit. Uh, this has long been a challenge for us, and that's what we're going to be talking about today, including what we see as some very possible and exciting uh, solutions. So let me begin by sharing my screen and uh, putting some things into context for us. Uh, this is Singapore. I had occasion to be in Singapore not long ago, and it's a very impressive city. Uh, you could call it a city-state, that would be more accurate. And what's amazing about Singapore is the transportation. Uh, I use the public transportation system, as everybody does. And uh, I'm telling you, it's just utterly fantastic. I couldn't believe how smooth, how slick, how easy, and how seamless it was. Uh, this gives you a sense of it. Uh, it's, uh, it's abundantly easy to understand where you are, where you're going. The signage is all terrific. It's uh, multimodal. It has, of course, heavy rail. It has light rail. It has uh, fabulous buses. You always know where the bus is. You always know when the bus will be arriving. Uh, the buses are high capacity. They're all set up with, uh, uh, with wireless uh, connectivity uh, and then transfers across all of these different platforms from heavy rail to light rail to the bus uh, to other forms uh, is all, uh, it's actually easy and it's seamless. Paying, by the way, is also easy. Uh, you just, uh, you just uh, tap your card or your, uh, or your cell phone onto the device and uh, there it is. You, you can just pay very simply. And it's a simple app that you download. The app is connected to your bank account. So you can even have it just uh, drawing directly from your bank account, even without the app. And uh, people actually use this app to store uh, funds, uh, including uh, slush funds that they use for their regular spending in other areas. In other words, it's just easy, it's seamless, it's integrated with your other, uh, with, with your other uh, life information. And in Singapore, it just really couldn't be more easy. Uh, I also had occasion to go to Hong Kong. Hong Kong was the same thing. It was fabulous, absolutely fabulous. Uh, one interesting thing about Hong Kong is that uh, they, like San Francisco, have an enormous body of water uh, that defines their region. And uh, unlike the Bay Area, uh, that water is dotted with ferries. And the ferries are an integrated part of that system. The ferries uh, very seamlessly connect to the other forms of uh, ground transportation. Uh, the forms of water transportation are really impressive. Uh, here's a hydrofoil, here's a jet foil. Um, so you can get around that way. And again, it's fantastic. Uh, this is a trip that I took to Europe. I was actually uh, in um, the Netherlands and I was asked to give a talk in Enschede. And so in Enschede, uh, when, it was time to, uh, when it was time to return, I hopped onto this train. And this train is amazing. It was uh, it was easy to it was easy to access. Again, uh, perfectly uh, seamless wireless connectivity the entire trip. Uh, at this station, at this train station, I checked my luggage all the way to San Francisco. In other words, I got onto this train, but I never touched my luggage again until I got off the plane at San Francisco. That's how seamless and effective it was. And um, it was uh, it was a fabulous uh, it was a fabulous journey. Now I want to tell you what happened to me when I got uh, to the other end. Uh, I wanted to continue my journey to home, so for, I needed to get from San Francisco 
to Palo Alto, where I live. And this is what uh, uh, this is this is what it looks like for us in the Bay Area. This is five one one dot org, and I dialed in my location and I dialed in my destination. And here's what has to happen. There I am now with my luggage, which I have claimed at uh, the baggage claim. I am now on the ground floor of the terminal. I need to get up to the sixth floor of the terminal to catch the uh, airport uh, transit system, which delivered me to BART. Uh, so I had to negotiate elevators and escalators to get up to that, uh, up to the sixth level, and then uh, board that rail system over to the BART platform. Then I had to get off and I had to navigate the BART system. I had to buy a BART ticket. By the way, the signage in the airport wasn't great. I actually had to ask people uh, how to find this thing. And um, it, it, it wasn't, uh, wasn't self-explanatory. I'll just make that observation. Um, now it's time to get onto the BART. Uh, BART needs to connect to Millbrae, which is just about two thirds of a mile south of the airport. There's a fabulous intermodal station that we constructed uh, and there at Millbrae, you can catch Caltrain to go uh, to con continue your journey south towards Palo Alto and beyond. Well, guess what? You can't go from the airport directly to Millbrae. It's not possible. Um, you have to actually get onto a northbound uh, BART train. And I had to wait uh, several minutes for that train. It took me to San Bruno. In San Bruno, you have to get off, you have to navigate an escalator up, and then you have to navigate an escalator down, and then wait another 20 minutes for the southbound BART, which then took me to the Millbrae station. Uh, by the way, here's the, uh, I don't know if you can see it on the slide, but these are the directions that 511 gave to me. And it says interesting things like um, uh, arrive at San Bruno, then it says, walk to San Bruno. What does that mean? I couldn't figure out what that meant. And then uh, you continue your journey to Millbrae and then it says, walk to Millbrae. What does that mean? I couldn't, I couldn't understand it. It wasn't easily understandable to me. Uh, in time, I figured it out and continued my journey. Now, here's the last interesting thing. So now I have disboarded uh, BART and it, I now need to catch the Caltrain. Um, that requires leaving the BART system. So again, going down escalators, uh, going over ramps uh, with my baggage, by the way, I'm carrying baggage. And uh, now I have to enter the Caltrain system and I have to buy a Caltrain ticket. Uh, and I had to figure out where those machines were, how to put the money in. And uh, the transfer was not easy and it was not seamless. And, and um, uh, I, I had to uh, I had to enter money into a different paying system with different paywalls and and different uh, protocols. Then uh, I boarded my uh, southbound train and finally arrived in Palo Alto. So this, uh, my friends, is how transit works in the Bay Area. It uh, couldn't be more highly contrasting to the seamless systems that I experienced on that same journey in places like Europe or places like Asia. Now, the observation I want to make is that San Francisco, Bay Area for that matter, is a world-class destination. Uh, our peers, our colleagues on the world scene are in fact Singapore and Hong Kong and um, the capitals of Europe and, and, and so on and so forth. But we don't act like it. Uh, we don't look like it on uh, in the realm of transit. That's not uh, what the user experience feels like. In fact, if you are, like I was, committed to taking your journey by transit uh, from San Francisco to the airport to Palo Alto, you have to work very hard at it. It takes a tremendous amount of commitment and um, and it takes some wherewithal, uh, mental, psychological, and otherwise. In other words, it's not easy. We haven't made it easy uh, on, on the users in the, in the Bay Area. Um, uh, I've had similar experiences with the San Jose airport, by the way. Uh, I, I won't go into that. I want to leave time for my colleague, Ian, who I'm going to introduce in a moment. But here's one reason uh, why it's difficult in the Bay Area. Uh, we have not, a, a, not just a few transit operators. We actually have 27 of them. 
Um, that is a very big number. And these 27 operators are all working within their spheres and very hardworking, we should add. Uh, they're doing the very best that they can. They're delivering uh, transit within their realm of responsibility. Uh, but they do not have a clarion call to work collaboratively. They don't have a framework to work collaboratively with the other operators. So what we get is their willingness to collaborate uh, in uh, a handful of one-off kinds of arrangements. Uh, so some of them will get together and they'll try to figure out a transfer system or how to have maybe a unified ticketing operation, but that's happening in one-off combinations and it's not happening in a system-wide way uh, or in a way that is you know, unified, seamless, or integrated. That's not happening. And nor should we expect it to. That's not how, uh, that's not how discrete operators behave. Uh, for discrete operators to behave in a unified fashion, that takes something else. That takes uh, some overarching framework. Uh, they have to be incorporated into something that's bigger than themselves. And that's actually what we are proposing for the Bay Area. We think we need to figure that out. And we think we have figured it out. We think we see the way forward. So let me simply conclude by telling you this. Uh, these are not opinions. Uh, these are facts. The Bay Area system, by comparison to our peers, is fragmented. It is uncoordinated. It's very difficult to navigate. It's highly inefficient. And uh, it's not particularly equitable, especially when you think about the members of our community whose life is dependent, is dependent upon these uh, transit uh, systems. Um, let me uh, further point out that um, our peer regions have the opposite. As I've just described, they're integrated, they're aligned. Uh, you can coordinate your transfers. You don't have to pay an extra fee for the transfer. They have high quality hubs. They have common branding and customer information. And I don't think it's any surprise. I think it's directly causal. Those regions have higher ridership than we have in the Bay Area. So this is the problem. This is the opportunity that's assailing us as members of the Bay Area, we would like to fix that. And the answer is to do this, is to create a unified transportation network that works for all of us. So now I would like to uh, tell you that uh, Joint Venture has entered into a partnership with um, an organization called Seamless Bay Area, and they are doing exactly the work that we just talked about. Their policy director is Ian Griffiths. He's now going to take over the screen and he's going to tell you uh, about uh, where we see this effort moving and how you can be involved. Great, thank you so much, Russ. Um, and thank you to Joint Venture for uh, the partnership and the support for this work. Um, my name is Ian Griffiths and I'm uh, the policy director for Seamless Bay Area. Um, and I'll tell you about what is going on right now um, and in particular, uh, a piece of legislation um, and uh, that is uh, that are that is something that you can take action on as an organization or as an individual. Uh, so Seamless Bay Area, we are a nonprofit. Uh, our mission is to transform the Bay Area's fragmented public transit into a world class, unified, equitable and widely used system. Um, and we do that by both building a diverse movement for change among grassroots, grass tops leaders, um, as well as investigating and promoting the policy reforms that can bring that vision, this vision of this map, um, uh, and the vision of an integrated system into, re into reality. Um, to achieve that vision of a sustainable rider-focused transit system that attracts far more people to transit and, and gets them out of their cars, we need coordinated transit fare schedules, branding and service. We need to make it easy. We need faster, frequent and more reliable service than we have right now. And that's gonna require also more funding. We relatively underinvest in public transit service and capital compared to other peer regions. So funding is absolutely part of the picture. Um, but importantly, the governance is key. Uh, we need a regional network authority that actually has the mandate and authority to unify those 27 fragmented systems that we have. All of those conditions are important for us to be able to see that transformation. So public transit, of course, uh, you know, is connected to so many of our challenges. It's not just about, uh, about transportation. It's related to our quality of life. It's 
intimately connected to the lack of affordability in this region. People's access to housing options is very much related to how, how much can they get to that, where those, what housing options or job opportunities do people have access to within a reasonable commute? And if the transit system is not functioning well, it reduces people's opportunities and access to affordable options. And of course, transportation is our biggest source of greenhouse gas emissions in the state as well as in this region. So we have to make progress and mode shift in order to be able to realize our ambitious goals for greenhouse gas reductions in the transportation sector. And we need to do more than just electrify our vehicle fleets. We need to shift people out of vehicles and into public transportation. We don't have a great track record over the past several decades. And even prior to COVID, the transit system was not keeping up in the Bay Area, even though many, we think it should be the backbone of our transportation network. So ridership was going down between 2001 and 2016 on a per capita basis. Bus, average bus speeds were going down, average commute times were going up. Um, and because of COVID, of course, the situation is much more dire. We've seen uh, even more drastic decreases in ridership. So our challenge to not only reverse the trajectory of COVID, but actually get on a positive growth trajectory is, is, is very, very uh, significant. We talk to people all the time about why they're not using transit or if they even want to use public transit. And I'd say the average response we hear when we talk to members of the public from all over the region, from all walks of life, is that people want to take transit more. They really would use it if it was a convenient and reliable option. But so often people say that they don't use it because it's just too difficult. It, it takes too long. It doesn't take people where they need to go. It may not be frequent enough. And oftentimes it's too confusing or they just don't even know where to start. Um, and, or they've had a bad experience and then they don't want to ever try that again because they, they don't want to take the risk that it won't work out for them. Um, Russ showed this uh, diagram that um, you know, really shows that we don't have, uh, we have 27 different operators. There is actually no regional vision that is uh, put out of how they're supposed to work together. Uh, this is not part of something that is part of our regional planning right now. Just about four or 5% of all trips taken in the Bay Area are on public transit. That is compared to about over 70% that are done in private automobiles. And there's a huge amount of barriers to, for people to, to use transit. Um, and many of these agencies are struggling with the exact same issues and even more so uh, due, due to the COVID pandemic. Um, so by contrast, the seamless vision that we want to realize is, is visualized by this map. This is a map that we created uh, when we first started several years ago to really show the public uh, what it could be like, what um, if we actually put all of our high capacity rail and bus and ferry lines on the same map and we actually uh, planned it as an integrated system, what would it look like? What degree of connectivity would that provide and how would people use about it, use it and think about it differently? This is the vision that we need to be working toward. Um, a strategically planned network that actually works as a system across all modes. This requires that transit agencies, and there may continue to be many of them, we don't, merging all the 27 agencies into one is not the, uh, not the only way of achieving this vision of seamlessness, but those seams need to be invisible to the user. And that requires that certain aspects of public transit be standardized to be consistent, service quality, fares, schedules, wayfinding, signage, need to be as simple and reliable as possible for users. And as I mentioned, funding is really important as well. We need to increase service levels uh, across most of our network to be able to have the train and the bus come more frequently. And that is a big part of uh, making it simpler and more reliable is reducing the amount of wait time that people have as they're changing modes. So how do we get there? Uh, a really important, having done the research uh, over the past couple of years, uh, looking at many of the examples that, that Russ had indicated in his slides, as well as others around the world, we see a common feature of high ridership transit systems around the world uh, that do much better than ours in attracting riders is the existence of an effective regional transportation network manager entity, basically an authority that is region-wide that oversees core functions of the public transit system and that aren't done on an agency by agency basis. Those functions, those things listed under this first image include 
you know, overseeing the long range planning for the system as a whole, fair policy, service standards, regional schedules, the overall customer experience, branding, data, and in some cases, the project delivery of major mega projects to really establish centers of excellence that can deliver those mega projects on time and on budget. Uh, this can provide the clear accountability for the transit network as a whole for the public. Um, this can be done while recognizing that we might have many different local agencies and local uh, funding sources, which is a significant feature of the Bay Area's public transit ecosystem is we have a lot of county sales tax measures, we have a lot of local funding measures. Uh, that, that funding framework is not inconsistent with having a, a regional entity that is able to oversee the system as a whole. Um, and, we can and, and that's a feature of, in particular, many of the European systems, such as in Germany and Switzerland, that also have a lot of local jurisdictions, they have a lot of local funding sources, but the experience is still seamless for users. Um, and we have, you know, on the bottom here are some examples of, of, some, of some of the, the examples from around the world that we've looked at. The best example in the United States is probably Sound Transit in Seattle, uh, of having an effective network manager in the form of Sound Transit that has made that region the only place in the United States that's actually significantly increased transit ridership uh, over the past uh, decade or so. So, what has Seamless been doing to make progress on this issue? I'll talk about a couple of the initiatives and I'll, and I'll end with the particular piece of legislation that's in the state legislature right now and how you can help. So we've been working since 2018, since we started this group um, to really grow a movement. We know we need riders from all parts of the world. We need, uh, this, is, this, this type of change would affect a lot of different, different institutions, but it's enormously popular. So part of succeeding is showing just how uh, broadly supported these reforms are. So we've used something called the seamless transit principles to build broad political and grassroots support for this vision of seamless transit. They're, they're shown here on the page, seven very basic principles that most people would agree with, like run all Bay Area transit as one easy to use system, put riders first, make public transit equitable and accessible to all. And at this point, we now have over 91 groups that have endorsed these principles. Uh, Joint Venture being, of course, uh, a, a recent uh, endorser of these. Uh, we have 22 public agencies, um, the city of San Jose, very recently the county of Santa Clara, uh, a dozen or more than a dozen other cities, including Oakland, Berkeley, East Palo Alto, Fremont, um, even some transit agencies, including the BART board, unanimously adopted these principles, the ferry authority, and then the groups across the political spectrum, housing groups, uh, business groups, labor groups, environmental groups. This is showing that this is not a controversial issue at all. This is something that is very, very broadly supported. Um, oops. Uh, okay. Uh, another thing that's been going on is um, there's been, due to our advocacy and the advocacy of other allied groups, there's been a focused study on one particular aspect of, of integration, which is integrated transit fares, which is a significant source of revenue for transit agencies and a core to uh, having a seamless system. So there's been an important study that's been underway since 20, uh, 2019 in this region that was adopted by our region's transit agencies in 2021 that actually recommended for the first time some really innovative steps uh, to create a, a multi-agency pass for riders that will be available this summer on a pilot basis uh, that will allow someone to purchase a pass for the first time that actually gives them a limited access to you know, all the transit systems for one price for, for the month or for, for even a day. That's only gonna be on a pilot basis, however. Um, it's also, uh, they're also gonna be rolling out free transfers between agencies in 2023. So there's some incremental steps happening that, that we're really, really pleased with. However, the longer term more significant steps like a regional, a standard fare region wide uh, or a standard distance paced fare for our regional providers, which was shown to have huge benefits for the public as well as the rollout of that multi-agency pass for members of the public while those steps were recommended, there's no deadline for getting them done. And there's still some uncertainty as to you know, whether, whether, whether they're going to actually happen based on just based on going through the regional studies that we have going on right now. 
Uh, and the image on the right is a, is a map that we created that really we used as a, a tool to build awareness and support for what a zone-based uh, system that covered the whole Bay Area could look like and how that would transform uh, people's access. We've worked um, very hard over the past several years to build the political will to do something about this and the political leadership um, to, to match that grassroots support that we've also been working on. So since 2018, uh, we've worked especially closely with uh, former Assemblyman uh, David Chu, who represented San Francisco on a couple of different pieces of legislation that would bring about a network manager. Um, the first bill in 2020 was a task force bill that would have created a focused task force to study this issue of governance on how we get to a network manager and what the right way of setting it up is. Of course, that 2020 was a COVID-19 pandemic. So like many bills that did not move forward, but even the introduction of that bill and the extremely positive response that it got across the region meant that even though the bill did not move forward, the MTC and, and leaders in the Bay Area actually chose to create something else called the Blue Ribbon Transit Recovery Task Force uh, to not only uh, address the challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic on transit, but to make sure that we fundamentally use this time and this disruption to rebuild transit in a way that's more connected than the system that we had before COVID. And we don't wanna just re rebuild that very fragmented system that we had before, but let's, uh, but the task force was tasked with understanding the sets of issues that need to be addressed to set us on a much better trajectory moving forward. Um, now we are working with, because assembly member two has now moved on to a uh, city attorney's position in San Francisco, we're really pleased to be working with uh, Senator Josh Becker, um, and he has taken the mantle and introduced a bill uh, that we are co-sponsoring alongside Joint Venture Transform uh, Bay Area Council and Silicon Valley Leadership Group called the Seamless Transit Transformation Act. And I'll talk a little bit more about that particular piece of legislation. Uh, but, but first, um, the, I want to mention a couple more things about the Blue Ribbon Ta Task Force and this Transformation Action Plan, because it's actually the basis for this legislation that we've that we're all working on together to try to pass. So after the pandemic, when this task force was created, uh, Seamless was invited to be on the task force, as was David Chu, as were political leaders, general, general managers of all the late, largest transit agencies and uh, nonprofit groups and, and advocacy groups and labor groups from across the region. Um, it was a really uh, unique uh, coming together of, of people from all work, walks of life to develop a common vision and uh, it's really the basis for how we should move forward. It, for the first time, it adopted this vision of a, of a unified system of unified service, fare, schedules, customer information. That is now an officially adopted plan that our region has bought into um, and that general managers of individual transit agencies have bought into. Um, it has identified for the first time the governance as a key barrier to change and the, the need for network management resources and authority and this next step on that particular issue of governance is something is basically a study, um, an analysis uh, called the Network Management Business Case Study. That is this year, it's, it's looking into what are the possible governance options for Bay Area Transit. And we expect that by this fall, we'll have some recommendations coming out of that study that should have some buy-in from the transit agencies themselves and from leaders um, for how we actually reform transit governance to put in place this network management authority over the long term. Uh, it also identified among its 27 actions, uh, a number of different low hanging fruit steps that we can take over the next couple of years. Um, and that's really the focus of SB 917, the bill is, is focusing on those things that we can accomplish within the next two to three years that can actually make incremental progress uh, that aren't dependent on us having the network manager, the broad, you know, long-term governance reform, which is still important, but we want to make sure that we actually deliver on some of those key deadlines that were set regarding integrated fares, branding and wayfinding, and developing an integrated service plan. Uh, so before I talk about uh, just before 917, this is overwhelmingly popular and <laughs> something that has also happened in the past years. We've had some very good, reliable professional polling on just how popular these provisions are by the public. And this has been very significant to build the political will to do something. So this poll was 
uh, done based on uh, people's attitudes towards AB 9, uh, 629, which was a bill, the second bill that Assembly Member Chu introduced last year that had many of the same objectives of 917. Um, and you can see just overwhelming support, almost 90% in every single part of the region. Um, so this is something, and, and especially strong among regular transit riders, but also among uh, non-transit riders for this, this vision of a seamless system. So this is key to building the public support uh, for people's continued desire to invest and fund public transit. This is what people want the, the outcome to be of their investments in public transit system, in, in the public transit network. So SB 917, just a couple more details about what specifically this bill does. Um, and, it's, and it's being co-authored by, uh, by about seven people in the Senate and the Assembly, in addition to the main author, Becker. Um, it, what it does is it sets near-term deadlines for MTC, the region's existing uh, transportation uh, planning authority, albeit one that has limited powers but it still can do certain things. So it's, it's setting deadlines for MTC to develop in consultation with the region's transit agencies. Um, first, a connected network plan by 2024, which is basically a service vision of what is our vision of how we should be running service in the Bay Area. Uh, the key hubs, the key transit corridors, the levels of service that actually work logically together as a system. They can be a basis for how we begin to adapt our routes to make more sense, but also can be a really important vision to put in front of voters for when we have a major ballot measure in the future to be able to say, we don't want just a laundry list of projects on the ballot, but we want an actual vision of integrated service and one that has been thoughtfully developed. Um, so the connected network plan is one component of the bill, uh, putting in place an integrated fare structure by mid 2024 is another part that would at a minimum include free transfers, uh, common definitions of seniors and students and all of the different categories. Um, but that when funding is available for the bigger moves of a regional uh, common fare structure for the regional services like BART and Caltrain, as well as uh, multi-agency passes, it provides the authority to incorporate that into that, those, those provisions into this integrated fare structure uh, from 2024 onward. Uh, and it basically creates this as an annual process that MTC would need to update every year and all the transit agencies will need to comply with um, in order to receive their annual allocations of funding from MTC. Um, lastly, uh, universal wayfinding standards and real-time information standards are two other components of, of the bill that uh, MTC would be responsible for developing according to certain deadlines. And all of these components are, we're, we're already in the transformation action plan. These are already things that our, our region has, has committed to in some form. What we're just doing is we're putting it in legislation because, uh, and we're tying it to funding because uh, we have a record in the past of, of having very aspirational reports, uh, putting in place certain deadlines, but then not, no, one's, no one's holding our, our agencies accountable for actually meeting those deadlines. So that's, a, a big reason why we think this bill is important is it needs we need to be accountable for these big blue sky ideas that we've we've talked about, but we actually need to deliver on them because we failed to so many times in the past. And then in the broader context of what happens after SB 917, uh, just to show uh, this timeline in, in white, you know, we have a number of the studies that have already gone in these white boxes are a number of the studies that are that have been going on or are now concluded like the Blue Ribbon Task Force, like the fair integration study. Um, we have the upcoming network management business case that I mentioned that's happening this year that's looking at the broader governance issue. There's a couple of other studies going on in our region. SB 917, of course, is a, is a, is a, is a legislative step that we can take this year to really strengthen our, our transit integration timeline and really get to those deadlines around integrated service wayfinding and fares. But 2023 is going to be a really important year for all other legislation, including legislation that could actually create that governance reform permanently and create desi designate the network manager for the Bay Area. And that could include the bringing together of, of some of our existing transit agencies under one roof, or it could, it could look like 
you know, altering the look and feel of, of MTC to, to have be a different type of agency that has a different set of mandates. All of those options are being studied right now, but there's gonna be the need for even more political support for that legislation in 2023. And then the last thing I'll point out is we, do, we are even more urgently in need of funding for public transit. We were before the pandemic for increasing service, but due to rider, the impact of COVID on, on transit agencies, most transit agencies in the Bay Area are, are looking at a major fiscal deficit uh, that will come in 2024, 2025, when a lot of the federal aid has run out. So we really need to um, look at having a ballot measure in the near future. We think 2024 is, is the right time to do that. Um, but, that's, but to get the voters to vote for such a measure, we need to offer them a compelling vision of what they're actually going to be voting for. And we think that the vision of a seamless system and being able to show progress on some of these integrated programs is going to be an important uh, uh, way of building the confidence and the public support for a major regional funding measure. Okay, my last uh, slide here, how can you help? And then I'm happy to take questions and uh, discuss this further with you all and, and with Russ. So first of all, um, yeah, you can absolutely help and we need your help to make this all happen because Seamless um, is, is, it's a group and it's a community and it's, uh, it's building off of thousands of people all across the Bay Area who have taken some kind of action uh, to be able to build the type of, and the scale of the political and grassroots support that we have right now. So the very first thing, if you are not already on our mailing list, I'd ask you to do that right now because that is how you can stay informed There's gonna, uh, over the next number of years. And there are gonna be many, many, times we're, we're going to need your help in different ways depending on who you are um, so please sign up at seamlessbayarea.org and we'll be keeping you informed of those opportunities we don't send out that many emails maybe two a month or so and they're always packed with really relevant information about how you can take actionable change if you represent an organization or a public agency uh, if you sit on a transit board or a city's city council um, you can submit a support letter for SB 917, or, or even if you need a public agency, you can adopt a support position for SB 917. And if you can do this by April 20th and submit that letter to the legislative portal of the state, the state uh, legislature, that is a really important step that you can take. So I'd encourage you to do that. And there will be an email going out after this if you've registered for this uh, forum where that will have all of the relevant links and a template letter that you can just adapt, put in your logo and your name and signature and submit that letter. And having that broad support for the committee to view uh, by April 20th is an important step to make sure that SB 917 passes. If you're an individual, uh, write your state legislators and urge them to support SB 917. And especially if your, your Bay Area representative uh, in the Senate or in the assembly is not already co-authoring the bill. So we've listed uh, nine particular uh, senators and assembly members uh, that we think are important who have not yet co-authored the bill uh, that we would, if you, are, if you recognize any of these names, we'd really urge you to write a quick note to them or make a phone call to their office and urge them to support SB 917 and express why you think a seamless transit system is so important. If you, and then uh, more broadly, we just wanna to continue to build the support for the seamless transit principles. So. Um, you can check out the list of who's already adopted the seamless transit principles on our website uh, or on the special URL, uh, seamlesstransitprinciples.org. Um, but having agencies formally adopt these principles is a really important way of engaging elected leaders on these topics. And it actually sets them up once they've adopted the principles to be very, very open and supportive of one, there's a piece of legislation or an issue that comes to them. They've had the chance to talk about it and they've seen the, the level of support. So please, we wanna grow the number of cities and transit agencies that have adopted these principles. And so we'd encourage you to, uh, to uh, look at those and, and urge uh, elected leaders you have relationships with to, to adopt them as well. And then very lastly, something fun that you can do uh, is uh, join us <laughs> uh, on March 15th. We are actually as an awareness building activity and also as a fundraiser we are going to be showing up at Beta Breakers and trying to bring together at least 27 people to dress up as the 27 transit agencies in the Bay Area to, uh, to run across the city together uh, as part of that race. 
um, as a fun, a fun community building thing to do to show what's possible when we work together. Um, and also to try to, to encourage people to engage their friends and family and, and, and raise funding for, for this ongoing initiative. So if that's of interest to you, I'll be there. Uh, I hope many of you will join and, and we, we, uh, we, will, we will be running together on that race. Um, so please sign up on our website if you're interested in that. Also, we'll be sending out the link. Um, but if, you don't, if you're not interested in running, you can also uh, financially support us or make a donation uh, on our website. Um, uh, and we are, of course, uh, very appreciative of companies and foundations who want to partner with us because this advocacy does take resources and dedicated staff. So if that is something that you can do, or if you're interested in talking more about that, I really encourage you to get in touch with me. My email address is right here. Um, and that is it. So thank you so much and uh, happy to take some questions. I see many have come into the chat and I'll try to look at those now. Well, uh, I, actually, I'll jump in and, uh, and, and moderate just a bit. Uh, one quick comment, uh, Ian. Uh, Beta Breakers is May 15th, not March 15th. So oh, did I? Was the date wrong yeah. there? Sorry. Yeah. Uh, so you'll take that slide, but uh, we just want yeah. everybody to know that that's uh, actually May 15th. Uh, let me also tell uh, our audience that uh, we're now moving into questions, and the best way for you to pose those questions is by typing them into the question and answer feature. And you'll see that on the menu at the bottom of the screen. And we've already had it uh, uh, filled up with a number of questions. So I'm going to go there now. And uh, Ian, you and I will bat these around, OK? We'll do our very best to provide straightforward answers if there is such a thing. Uh, the first mm -hmm. one is uh, uh, an observation that the difference between the Bay Area and places like Hong Kong and Singapore is that they have very different uh, governance systems, very different from the political powers in, the, in California and the Bay Area. That's absolutely true. That's an insightful comment. Um, those places are not encumbered by uh, as much democracy as, as is encumbering uh, the Bay Area, a place where essentially everybody has veto power. So that's true. That's absolutely true. But uh, I think what is significant about this effort that we're describing is that it is rooted in a, a keen understanding about institutional structure and the fact that structure isn't what actually drives outcomes. So Ian, I think what's significant here is that we really are trying to take a structural approach to changing something which is a disjointed 27 player uh, uh, enterprise. Uh, so if you could just say a, a quick word about that. Yeah, and I'll just, I think, to use it, there are other examples besides Hong Kong and Singapore that are much more like the Bay Area. And, and I think one that I know a lot about is, is Switzerland. So Switzerland has very local, a lot of local control, a lot of local uh, jurisdictions, uh, a strong tradition of, of, habit, of making local authorities, uh, uh, lo local decisions. Um, and they have uh, four times the transit ridership that we do they have managed to make it seamless for riders. So it is, there are, there are a lot of those particular examples are, yes, are very different political systems from where we have, but, um, but we, Russ is absolutely right. Having the, the institutions that are oriented towards those passenger outcomes is the most important things. And, and those, can, those can be done in a, in a number of different political environments. Uh, and including ones that are much more like the Bay Area, where you have a lot of local democracy, you have a lot of local uh, interest in these topics and, and desire to preserve the voices of local communities. Peter Katz says, this, is all, this all seems so logical and necessary. Who is against it and why? What are the barriers uh, to making it happen? The, I would say the biggest, uh, resistance, and it's not universal, I think, it, but, but transit agencies um, are, um, you know, the, the, I would say more so the, the many of the long-term staff of transit agencies and, and senior leadership of transit agencies are, um, they're, they're not necessarily resistant, but they're, some, they're very cautious on, on moving towards these types of reforms. I think many of Many folks who have been at transit agencies for many years have seen past examples where we've tried to go down this road and um, we haven't succeeded. Uh, so there's some skepticism that it's even possible. Uh, there have been some poor decisions that have been made in the past that have made people uh, perhaps pessimistic that we, can, that we in the Bay Area are capable of something uh, different. 
I think there's also been a lack of new resources brought to transit. So there's been the desire to make things more efficient, but without really bringing the funding to the table that's needed to actually uh, to move into a direction of change. So um, I think there's a lot of support among political leaders um, and, and, and among community groups. So that's why that's where we're focusing our energy is trying to build that support as well as working with staff to um, address people's concerns, to listen to what they're, what, what they're hearing, but also, um, but also just uh, make, make it clear where we're trying to get to. Um, Thanks Ian for that. Um, I think it's worth underlining or underscoring that um, significantly the transit agencies themselves are not opposed. Nobody has come out and said, we oppose this legislation. They are offering helpful amendments. They are asking about longer time horizons so that they can uh, get all of their uh, wherewithal together. Um, but it's, it's significant that this really is something that's proceeding in uh, partnership with MTC, the Transportation Commission and the, and the operators themselves. Uh, ben Falter says, how do we address the reliability of our transit systems? I see this part of being seamless. Nobody wants to connect agencies that are all running delays with poor communications to riders. I've been in many countries with much less infrastructure and there are not such delays. Uh, that's a hard problem, but, uh, and seamless doesn't address it directly, but indirectly, absolutely. Would, would you agree, Ian? Yeah, I think, I think indirectly, I think, I think by having, centers of excellence in operations. I think there's a lot of opportunity by um, through scale uh, at which we operate our transit agencies to improve practices and to invest more in maintenance and reliability. I think uh, 27 independent efforts to create a reliable system that uses worldwide best practices and deploy the best technology to improve reliability. You're likely to have many more gaps than if you have a center of excellence on this topic for bus operations or for rail operations. Um, so I think that that is part of the reforms that the outcomes that we want to see with reforms, maybe not directly done by the network manager, by, but by other uh, types of reforms that might be part of uh, uh, including in possible consolidations or the creation of a center of excellence for transit operations and reliability. Um, those are, that's absolutely going to be critical to improving the faith in that customers uh, can rely on public transit. Dennis Hermillo says, would an increase, he asks, would an increase in ridership cover the additional cost for more frequent transit vehicles? Um, you know, uh, I suspect most people understand this, but just to clarify, uh, transit doesn't pay for itself. It almost never has. Uh, they refer to what's called the fare box recovery ratio. In other words, how much of how much of the operation does the fares received cover? And uh, in the Bay Area, BART has the highest fare box recovery ratio. And guess what it is? It's uh, I think it's in the 60s. Am, am I right, Ian? It's about 60, 60 percent. 70s, yeah. I mean, this is all pre-COVID. And Caltrain's up there as well. Uh, yeah, in the 70s. exactly. Yeah. Uh, but in the Bay Area, we have other operators who are down in the 30s and, 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 and even less. Uh, so the premise is never that the fare box will cover transit uh, operations. Uh, there have to be other funds as well. And that's uh, one reason this is always such a struggle. And of course, one reason why we're looking for additional efficiencies by uh, accomplishing these kinds of integrations. Anything to add to that, Ian? Just that um, with integration, um, there, there, are, there are the, once you get to a certain level of service, there are, um, uh, it's a virtuous cycle. It can be a virtuous cycle of you, of you put out more service. It's really great. That attracts more riders the buses fill up or the trains fill up and you need more service and you can actually increase the amount of uh through through increasing ridership you can actually uh justify putting out more service and oftentimes bring in more fare box than we have right now and the most effective systems in in europe and hong kong actually have much higher uh amounts of fare revenue that are coming into this system because they just provide much higher quality service but to get there we have to invest more so yeah ultimately there are there are uh, returns that we can get that can help us, you know, fund even more service. But um, but it it isn't as simple as just uh, you know. I think where we're at right now, in particular, the hole that we're trying to dig ourselves out of with COVID, uh, there is good, there is absolutely the need for to to invest in this system prior to us being able to see the returns on that investment of of increased ridership and fare revenue. 
Cynthia Ruby asks if there's the possibility of BART extending through Atherton or along 101 or 280. Um, Cynthia, that would be a miracle. Uh, <laughs> that would be an absolute miracle. And my answer to your question is to say that we need to work on one miracle at a time. And uh, so the, the prior miracle will be getting BART into San Jose. And that project is underway. It has funding. It doesn't have full funding, but it, it's, uh, it's, it's fully underway. And that clearly is the first step to take before we talk about other forms of, uh, of BART extensions. Ian, anything else? On that well, the part? peninsula, this is a perfect example, actually, of, of the importance of seamlessness. We, we have yes. the Caltrain corridor along the peninsula. Yep. Uh, Caltrain and BART should work as one seamless system. Um, and in fact, Caltrain, there, there's upgrades already planned with Caltrain to, to increase the levels of service on Caltrain over the next 10 or 20 years to be the same frequencies as BART. So um, I would say just generally uh, a BART extension along the peninsula to that actually parallels Caltrain is probably not the, it isn't the most logical idea when we have the more cost-effective thing would be to really make Caltrain and BART work seamlessly and to, to begin to operate those uh, those two systems such that uh, it, it basically feels like all one BART system or all one system that we could would call something else that's not BART or Caltrain. It's one, one seamless rail system uh, that, uh, that would avoid the need for expensive new capital projects to build a new BART extension up the peninsula. Um, I'm going to uh, pose the final question and I'm just scrolling through uh, because we promised to end at 10 o'clock and we will keep that promise to you. Uh, but Tom Abate, a great journalist, a recovering journalist, uh, asks uh, or says, I think we must admit and confront that equity and exclusivity are elements of public opposition. The most affluent communities are mass transit deserts, in part by preference. So the potential for crime or fear of crime or potential deterrence, especially the day after the Brooklyn shooting on a, uh, on a transit uh, uh, friendly city where, where I grew up. That's right, Tom's from Brooklyn. Anyway, Ian, uh, Give us a quick comment about that issue. Absolutely. I mean, I think I agree with some aspects of this statement um, that um, that without effective regional institutions, um, there are certain opposition to um, some public transit investments have been driven by by the desire for uh, you know, the, the desire for exclusivity. Um, I think that is part of our history that we have to acknowledge, but it is not an inevitable future around how we need to continue to operate. Um, so I think, again, it does come down to governance and who represents us and who, how accountable the institutions are to the vast majority of people and are, are our governance, governments being responsive to what, what most people want or are they being responsive to what you know, a limited set of people who might be opposed to certain improvements that would otherwise, you know, benefit most people, uh, are, they, are they being responsible, responsive to those people? Um, but I also want to say, the polling, you know, look at the, the polling that I showed, um, does show that, and that across all income spectrums, across um, when you frame this issue in in a in a in a in a high level way. People from all income backgrounds are supportive of a high quality transit system. And I think um, when you offer them a vision of how it could be, um, I, think, I think it is some, a, a unifying uh, idea. And so I'm, I'm optimistic that even people who have historically opposed these ideas may, may view a, a bus or a train extension as something that doesn't add value to their community. I think there are ways of bringing those people uh, in, into support of this so that everyone sees it as something that will uh, make all of our quality of life better. Even if you don't use the train or the bus yourself, it still benefits you in, in many different ways. And we have reached 10 o'clock, so we are going to bid you goodbye. Before we do, we want you to know that you will have an email uh, in your inbox today, and it summarizes all of the action items that we put up on the screen, the things that you can be doing right now to assist in this effort. And we hope uh, most of all that you'll join the mailing list so that we can continue to update you and continue to mobilize your support because it will be needed. Ian, thank you for joining me on this Zoom today. 
uh, thank you for your expertise. Thank you for your leadership. Um, members of our audience, thank you for caring about the region. Thank you for joining us in that spirit. We bid you a very good day.